All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the Blank Park Zoo, first of all, for the invitation to come out and talk tonight. And I want to thank you all for coming out on a very cold and blustery spring day. I've, I've been promised that better weather is ahead, although we'll have to see. <laughs> Um, as mentioned, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Wildlife Conservation Society and what we are doing in Afghanistan. Um, before I do that, I want to talk very briefly about WCS itself. Um, as mentioned, WCS was started in 1895. It makes us one of the oldest conservation programs um, in the world. Our, our base is in the Bronx Zoo. Um, but as mentioned, we actually work in, or we run, four zoos and an aquarium in the metropolitan New York area. The, Organization, though, is actually split into two sides. There's the living institution side, which runs these zoos and aquarium, and then there's the global program, uh, which works in over 60 countries around the world with about 3,000 field staff overseas. So it's a really big organization. Um, you probably, you may not have heard of us, uh, partly because a lot of our work is focused on on-the-ground landscape work. We're a science-based organization. We have over 200 PhDs on staff. Um, we're focused on actually science-based conservation on the ground, not, not lobbying or trying to convince governments or, or media campaigns. It's really based on the ground science conservation work to try to improve wildlife situations and improve people's livelihoods at the same time. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Afghanistan, but before I do that, I need to start talking about Pakistan, and I consider this my, my bona fide slide. Um, one of those people you might recognize, uh, the New Balance sneakers might give me away. Uh, <laughs> I originally started going to uh, the mountains in northern Pakistan in 1992, uh, originally to do research on an animal called the woolly flying squirrel which is not only the world's largest flying squirrel, <laughs> stretching about four feet from the tip of its nose to the tip of its tail, um, but it was also, it was discovered in 1888 and last seen in 1924. So at the time that I went over to Pakistan, it had been considered to be extinct for 70 years. Um, perhaps not the smartest thing to go looking for. But in fact, one of the reasons that it had been missing in action for such a long time is that it turned out that it lived in cliff caves. And the only way to get these animals was to either climb up these cliffs or in cases, rappel down the sides of them to get to these caves where the squirrels were living during the day. But catch them we did. Um, the first animal was, was captured in, I guess, 1994. We managed to put collars on them, track them, find all kinds of interesting stuff about them, which included the fact that they ate primarily pine needles, which is a really unusual food for a mammal to eat. There are some mammals that can do it, but it's a very difficult food source because of the waxy covering. It's got a bunch of secondary chemicals that are unpleasant. Um, but these animals were chowing down on them between about 90 and 95 percent of their diet seemed to be pine needles. Very strange. But what that meant was that they were dependent upon the pine forests that were there. And what I discovered was that those pine forests were disappearing at a really alarming rate. What was happening is this was a tribal area in Pakistan, and the local people owned their resources, but they were completely off the grid. I mean, really just living in stone huts, no electricity, no running water. And Groups called the Timber Mafia, which is essentially the, the timber um, organizations in Pakistan, would come in, buy rights to their forests, and clear cut them. And this is the result. And what would happen, of course, is that local communities would lose their timber, lose their firewood, lose the building materials. Um, the pastures would be destroyed because the soils would slump from erosion. It was a real problem, and local people realized that. And so I, I sort of had a choice. I could either continue to study the woolly flying squirrel and essentially catalog its demise. Um, it had been missing for 70 years, but I could actually watch it go extinct, or I could try to do something about it. And I opted for plan B in this case, which is I started the WCS Pakistan program to try to link conservation with livelihoods and improved governance in this part of Pakistan. Um, as you can see, it's really off the beaten track. That's a little village right here. Um, in the mountains. It's, it's some of the most mountainous regions in the world. It's, it's got numerous mountains over 20,000 feet in elevation, including K2, the second highest mountain in the world. It's considered to have the greatest amount of glaciation outside of the polar regions. It's a, it's a tough, difficult place to live. Um, and it's not an easy place to work. And what I ended up doing is going out in these potato fields and, and crouching down and talking to village elders for months at a time, not crouching for months at a time. My knees couldn't handle that. But, but going back and over and over again to talk with these guys to try to learn about what they thought was important 
in terms of the problems they were facing and try to come up with solutions that they would be interested in. Uh, we ended up actually working with a total of about 65 communities in this area, um, trying to educate them about conservation issues that they were facing and trying to come up with solutions that would work within the sort of cultural context that they faced in the country. Uh, we also focused on education within the schools. There were about 70 teachers in the region. We trained them all in conservation so that they could reach out to the children. And teachers were also very important people within the community, so they would then be able to reach out to the adults in the communities as well. We worked in community governance. We actually helped create new governance structures with these communities. The old Jurga method of, of governance wasn't really working when it came to dealing with these new environmental problems they were facing. So we created natural resource committees in each of these communities that was making decisions about natural resources, about the forests, and about the wildlife. Um, and we created 65 of them overall. Each of these community committees uh, had community rangers that were volunteers that we trained and deployed in this area to actually monitor wildlife and enforce the rules and regulations that were in the committee's bylaws. And eventually what we did is actually started to work with the government, the provincial government in this area, and the community. So many of these communities had actually never had real contact or a platform to, to deal with the government. They, they were really isolated. They had, they had never lost to anybody before in terms of a war. So Pakistan really had no control over them, which is why it was a tribal area. Um, the British, when they were involved in Pakistan, had never beaten these guys. But they were actually finally working again with the government in a co-management structure for natural resources. So in 2002, um, I took a break from WCS and spent six months leading a program for the United Nations doing a post-conflict environmental assessment of Afghanistan. And while I was over there, I thought, you know what? The cultural context was very similar, and I bet the work that we're doing in Pakistan could be scaled up into Afghanistan. Um, and a few years later, I had an opportunity with funding from USAID to actually try to make this happen which was the WCS Afghanistan program. Now, I get asked, why do conservation in Afghanistan? A lot. Um, you know, it's a war-torn country. It's a humanitarian crisis. What's there to save anyway? And there are a couple of different ways you can answer that. One is that 80% of Afghans depend directly on the natural resource base for their survival. These people are farmers. They are herders. Uh, if they don't have ways to feed their families, you cannot possibly have reconstruction and stability in a country like this, no matter what else you do. And, and trust me, um, after 25, 30 years of warfare, the environment has been very badly damaged. This is uh, an image from 1977 and then 25 years later of Baghdad's province in terms of the forest cover in, the, in that province. And as you can see, it's lost virtually all of its forest cover in that 25 years, not from bombs and gunfire, but from millions of displaced people moving across the countryside. Um, they've been separated from their, their original communities. They had no way of, of you know, finding a way to, to keep themselves warm in the winter, um, building shelters. It was just devastating to the countryside, very dramatic. But there's another reason why to do conservation in Afghanistan. And that relates to basically Afghanistan's location. It sits at essentially a crossroads. This is a picture of the original silk routes, of trading routes that between Europe and Asia. Uh, some of them went through Afghanistan. And part of the reason is that it does, it sits sort of in the middle of everything. You've got the Himalayas coming up here, and then eventually it turns into the, the Tian Shans and the Altais. So it's right at the sort of the corner of Asia in some ways. And so you end up having biological influences from Africa in the Middle East, from Southeast Asia, and of course from the North, as well as from the actual mountains itself. So what does that mean? Well, it's, it means it sits at the biodiversity crossroads as well. This is a, a camera trap photo of a snow leopard that was taken in Afghanistan. But it's not just snow leopards that can be found there. You also can find Persian leopards, lynx, caracal, leopard cat, palace cat, jungle cat, wild cat, and sand cat. There are nine species of wild cats found in, Af in Afghanistan. That is the same number of wild cat species as found in all of sub-Saharan Africa, all of the countries south of the Sahara Desert. Um, it's really a sort of an amazing country in many ways. And it's not just cats. You find what's called the mountain monarchs, Marco Polo sheep, the largest sheep in the world, with horns that actually can stretch six feet from tip to tip. Um, 
um, enormous animals. Uh, the Himalayan ibex, with beautiful back-swept horns that can climb cliffs just as easily as, well, easier than I can climb stairs, in fact. Um, the markhor, who's even better at climbing than, than the ibex, with its beautiful corkscrew horns. Um, you oftentimes find them in oak trees in the mountains. They're that kind of climbing ability. And the Uriel, which is sort of like a junior version of the Marco Polo sheep, a smaller sheep, but still beautiful in its own right. So doing conservation in Afghanistan is important because it, it's, it's working to try to preserve these iconic species that can be found there. It's also preserving unique cultures, the Wakis, the Hazaras, um, the Kyrgyz populations, people who've been living there for hundreds, sometimes thousands of years, and preserving unique landscapes. Um, despite what you see on the, on the evening news, Afghanistan has some astonishing landscapes in this country. So how do you do conservation in Afghanistan? Well, you're faced with the usual problems. Um, you can see this is one of our teams moving across a, a goat path through the mountains trying to get to our field site, um, crossing a swollen river high in the mountains, um, getting stuck in a river. Uh, you know, but these are the sorts of things that wildlife conservationists face whenever they go into the, the back country and have to deal with, with conservation issues. Afghanistan carries its own issues, though, which includes landmines and unexploded ordnance, and of course, a poor and unfortunately continuing to decline security situation. So one of the first things that we had to do when we worked in this country was create a real security standard for our, our program. So we have about 70 people that work in Afghanistan right now, Afghans and um, internationals. And I won't go into the, the whole list of, of all of the things we do, but I will say that it's, it's, it's impressive. Um, we have had one accident in Afghanistan, and it was a guy who fell over a box in the basement of our office um, and, and hurt his knee. And that's been it in eight years. And you know that knock on wood. But we are very, very careful in this country. So when we landed in Afghanistan in 2006, uh, it was the government had basically been operating for about three years, the new government. And so we, one of the first things that we really did was help them to actually draft the environmental laws. Um, in fact, the environmental law, as well as other laws, such as the rangeland law, the forestry law, um, the protected areas regulations. And we didn't just draft them, but we also helped train government officials and staff on what to do, how to actually implement those laws. We took uh, government staff on international study tours. We took them to the United States. We took them to South Africa, in this case, Indonesia, to show them sort of best practice conservation efforts in other countries so they would get a, get a good idea of what to do. Again, this country had been at war for 25 years, so they, had, they basically had lost 25 years of knowledge during that stretch. Um, so we were very active in trying to build their capacity back up during that time. But of course, we're very much a field-based organization. So we had a number of field sites, which included um, Bamiyan province, which is in central Afghanistan, um, up in sort of the southern Hindu Kush, uh, what's called the Wakhan Valley, this long pencil of land here in the east. And we did some work as well in Nuristan until recently. So one of the first things we had to do was uh, wildlife and rangeland surveys. So again, with 25 years where nobody had been doing anything related to conservation of the environment, there was no information, no baseline from which to assess both the situation at the time as well as in the future trying to assess whether our efforts were making any kind of improvements. So we spent a lot of time and continue to go out and try to collect information about Afghanistan's wildlife and rangelands. In Nuristan, we've focused on community-based conservation, especially around the forests. This is a, a beautiful forest of deodar cedar, and it really does look like that. It's a, it's a gorgeous landscape, uh, the parts that still have trees. Uh, working with local villagers to try to develop, again, the sort of things that we did in Pakistan, community uh, committees based on natural resource management, working with local schools, working with women. So we have a full-time gender specialist on our program. Obviously, in Afghanistan, it's it's complicated, um, the gender situation in this country. It depends on where you work. In Nuristan especially, it's a, it's a very, very fundamentalist Sunni area. And, but we still were able to get women trained up in a number of issues. Because of course, they're very important in terms of natural resource management in these communities. They, they do a lot outside with, with the farms, with forestry. So having them involved was critical. It took us a while, but it, it happened. 
In central Afghanistan, in Bamiyan, we worked on Bandi Amir, which is six really unique travertine dam lakes. So travertine is a material, calcium carbonate, I believe, that, that essentially just forms out of the water over hundreds of thousands of years into these bizarre natural dams. Um, these are actually, I don't know if you can see all that well, but these are actually people down here. So these, these dams are about 40, 45, 50 feet high. Um, and they hold these incredible basins of water, just crystal clear blue water um, in a maybe 10,000 foot high valley set in a beautiful gorge. That's, and it's not as impressive as the Grand Canyon, but it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, it's, it's an amazing place, what can I say? I, there's nothing like it else on Earth. And after three years of work with local communities and the government, um, we were very excited that Afghanistan made Bandimir not only Afghanistan's first national park, but first ever official protected area. Um, it was an important event uh, for Afghanistan. Um, it was a, a point of national pride that they managed to to do this. Um, what you're seeing here, this is US Ambassador Eikenberry at the ribbon cutting ceremony with the Vice President of Afghanistan, um, Governor Sarabi, the only woman governor in the country, um, and the Prince of Afghanistan. So it got a lot of attention within Afghanistan. It got a lot of attention nationally. Um, a real point of pride for the country. Of course, Announcing a national park is really just the first step in many ways. I mean, it took three years to get there, but now comes the national park management work where you're working with the local communities, the government, creating national park plans, um, getting them instituted, developing a ranger uh, team, working on livelihood development to make sure that local communities are benefiting from the park, from revenues and jobs that are, that are being created. Education and awareness, both with local communities to make sure that they understand what the park can do for them, as well as tourists. And of course, tourism. And you may laugh, tourism in Afghanistan. What am I talking about? And to be honest, I had nothing to do with the swan boats. This was, <laughs> this was another, another project altogether. But in fact, Bandimir gets on a good summer weekend about 4,000 people visiting it. Um, that's significant. That means a lot to the local communities in terms of opportunities for selling their handicrafts, for revenues from the park. Um, but it also means that there is a need for a tourism plan, which we've also been working on in terms of hotels, guest houses, camping, places for local pe the people to stay when they visit, um, hotels, activities for people to do when they come, um, and making sure that they're, they're not having a negative impact on the park itself, which is a pretty fragile desert environment, and making sure that the communities, once again, are benefiting from tourism that's coming into the area. In Wakam, that high pencil of land, one of the most isolated places in Afghanistan, which is a pretty isolated country, it, before we got a, an airstrip put in there, um, it was about a seven-day journey from Kabul into the mountains there. Um, just a really hard place to get to, and the people are very isolated, cut off from anything. One of the poorest places on the planet. So we have started working with these communities to, to get them trained up on the fact that the work that we were trying to do was going to improve their lives. A lot of community education. Um, when you reach out to schools, you're reaching out to the adult community as well. You can see here, this is a, a play of, on ibex and snow leopards being performed by the students. And pretty much the entire community is there watching and, and learning. We're building governance structures, much like we did in Pakistan again, um, both community governance structures and overarching governance structures, such as the Wakhan Premier Association, which consists of a representative from every community in Wakhan to make decisions about environmental and resource management across the entire region. Uh, community rangers, we have about 60 rangers now operating in this area. Um, they're trained up now, and actually they're completely running our snow leopard camera trap program, which has taken somewhat over 5,000 pictures of snow leopards in this region. And very excitingly, about a month ago, Afghanistan announced the creation of its second official protected area, Wakhan National Park, which was the entire Wakhan district about 12,000 square kilometers, um, a really kind of extraordinary gesture on, on the country's part. Um, again, now making that 
into something that, that is more than just a declaration is going to be a big job, but I mean, that's what we're there for, and we're there for the long haul. We're very excited about this opportunity. Um, we, we obviously have been working on threats to wildlife in Afghanistan. One of the biggest threats is wildlife trade. And interestingly, we did a study early on in the program and discovered that one of the biggest drivers of wildlife trade was the international community in Afghanistan. Um, the development community and the military. They come into the country, they have a lot of money, they're being paid a lot because it's a, it's a danger zone, um, and there's not much to spend it on. Uh, you can't go to the bars and restaurants there very often. Um, after you buy your first few carpets, what else is there to do but maybe buy a snow leopard pelt to bring home. Um, so we immediately leapt into action, began a, a campaign to work on the development community to make sure that they understood that what they were doing was bad for Afghanistan and illegal on many levels. And we began working with the military as well, training them at the bases in Afghanistan um, to understand that there was illegal wildlife trade going on in the country and that they should not be participating in encouraging it. And the military was all in favor of this because, of course, it puts their personnel at risk. They're breaking Afghan law. If they bring it back, they're breaking international law, and they're breaking US law. So they don't want to see their, their personnel being thrown in jail. Um, and they were very happy to have us come over and do trainings there. And we actually are now working with the Department of Defense here in the United States uh, to train uh, military personnel before they're deployed overseas to make sure that they understand these issues and the dangers that it has to not just the countries that they're in, but to themselves as well. A lot of our work has been also focused on improving livelihoods. These communities are very poor. There has to be some rationale for them to go through some of the work that they're doing to try to save wildlife um, in these wild places. And that includes, for example, uh, predator-proof corrals to make sure that they're not losing livestock to snow leopards or wolves. Again, one of the biggest problems up there is, is animals will be lost to the predators and then the shepherds will go out and kill the snow leopards in retaliation. So by building these, these predator-proof corrals, there's no longer that impetus to try to get rid of the predators in the area. We've been doing simple things such as just helping them build trails and roads. Um, and we've also helped them with uh, fuel-efficient stoves. The old-style stoves uh, were terribly polluting, and when you're spending a lot of time indoors as the women and children do, and as the entire families do during the winter when it's very cold, again, a lot of these families are 10, 12, 14,000 feet in elevation. It's cold and nasty and brutal for the winters. But these houses are just filled with smoke during that entire time. So it's an incredible health problem. Um, so fuel efficient stoves are very important, but it also prevents loss of shrubs in these high elevation uh, pastures which, of course, the wildlife and the livestock are both dependent upon, especially in winter. So it has a very important conservation implication as well as a health implication. We actually do a lot of veterinary work in Afghanistan as well. Uh, mass vaccination in the Pamirs to, to help local people with their, their livestock. Um, again, those vaccinations are tied into stocking rate decisions that these community committees are making in terms so we don't have too many animals, but you have healthy animals. You're not losing a lot of livestock, and therefore you're not forced to have more livestock on the pastures than can actually sort of be sustainable. We've been training local uh, people to be what's called paravets, essentially veterinarian help that go up into these mountains. Because again, these, there's, there's just no services available to these people. So we're providing the veterinary service that, that is actually getting up into these valleys and, and helping them. We've been doing projects such as avian influenza studies on water birds in the country and working with the Kabul Zoo in terms of training their staff on veterinary work. Finally, I want to talk about um, transboundary conservation. Uh, obviously, Afghanistan doesn't sit alone in this region. Um, the, the mountains up there are contiguous, even though there are borders drawn on maps. And many of the animals that live up there do not respect uh, country boundaries, no surprise. Um, Marco Polo sheep are moving across, snow leopards are moving across. We've, we have a number of snow leopards um, collared and we're tracking them and one of them actually traveled all the way from Wakhan into Tajikistan and back. So it's really important that this area try to be managed 
um, on a transboundary level, on a multiple country level. Because again, if wildlife is protected well in Afghanistan and they all go to, say, Tajikistan and get shot, it's not going to do our work very much good. So we have been trying to, to encourage the countries to work together to manage this land in a transboundary nature. And that started in 2006 with a big workshop that was held in China um, with high-level government officials from all four of these countries, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and China. Um, it was a surprisingly successful meeting. I didn't quite know what I was going to end up with. Uh, but all four governments agreed that this was important. Um, we came up with a declaration of over 100 recommendations in terms of the conservation work that needed to be done. And perhaps most interestingly, um, all four countries agreed that this should be a transboundary protected area that included parts of Tajikistan, um, pretty much the entire Wakhan corridor in Afghanistan, a good part of northern Pakistan, and a good part of the Chinese premiers as well. Um, I was really surprised by this, but delighted. Um, it hasn't progressed very much since then due to a variety of political events that have occurred. The Tajik government changed over and all the new people didn't know anything about this and weren't interested. The Pakistan government collapsed twice in, in a period of about three years. Uh, so we've had a little trouble gaining purchase in terms of actually making this into a transboundary protected area. But what we've tried to do is encourage the recommendations that came out of this meeting to actually be followed through with, regardless of whether or not there's actually a protected area that's defined there. So, and we thought that our ability to work in this area as, an, as a nonprofit organization focused on conservation was a good opportunity because we can work across this landscape. Um, we can be country specific. We have programs in Pakistan. We have a country program in China. We obviously have a country program in Afghanistan. All of these people have staff offices. Um, and we do work in Tajikistan. We don't have a full country office there yet, but we hope to. Um, and then we can knit this across in a transboundary manner um, because we have the ability to meet with these governments and bring them together in a way that they sort of feel like oftentimes they can't. I mean, as you know, Pakistan and Afghanistan are not the best of friends right now. Um, but we can actually bring them to the table to talk about essentially a, a non-political issue, which is conservation of snow leopards, conservation of Marco Polo sheep, preservation of the Pamir landscape. These are issues that, that don't carry the kind of political baggage that other issues do. And the countries are willing to come together to talk about that. We had a uh, project funded by the Forest Service um, on the Tajik premieres on transboundary conservation in 2011. Um, an ecosystem health project that looked at disease influence that was affecting both livestock and wildlife, because a lot of diseases will cross over from livestock to animals like Marco Polo sheep and ibex. Um, and these were, these were projects that occurred in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan. And then the veterinarian uh, experts came together to talk about their results. And actually, this fall, we're going to be holding a climate change meeting with those three countries as well to look at the climate change problem that's liable to be affecting this region in the near future. So I guess if I'm going to end this talk with a couple of points, take home points, as it were, um, we've really found that natural resource management in this area can improve not just people's livelihoods, not just obviously the wildlife situation, but it leads to a number of very interesting knock-on effects. Um, and one of those is that you can actually help to improve security by doing wildlife conservation in a conflict or post-conflict environment such as Afghanistan. Part of that is because when you're working with rural communities and agencies, um, and you're there long term, like WCS tends to be, again, we've been there for eight years. We have every expectation to be there for eight more, possibly 16, 25. We don't know, as long as it takes and as long as the security conditions allow. Um, and that leads to a sense of trust. And that trust, I think, can really improve security. When you can build capacity to manage resources that improve livelihoods um, and help with economic stability, that stability can also improve security. When you're building actual governance institutions that allow communities to interact with each other and allow those communities to interact with the government, you're improving a situation that, once again, improves security because you're actually allowing the reach and rule of law to extend all the way from basically the Kabul to these very distant rural areas. And that linking of, of local communities with government agencies is a huge step in a country like Afghanistan, 
where historically Kabul has had very little influence over much of the rest of the country. And we're, it's, it's not why we're there, but it's a very interesting effect of the work that we're doing. Um, I'll leave you with a quote um, from George Schaller. Some of you may know George Schaller. He's a very famous wildlife conservationist from WCS. He, uh, he did studies in this region in the 1970s, some of the first work on snow leopards, some of the first work on species like Marco Polo sheep, uh, wrote many books, um, including one called Stones of Silence. And I just really like this quote from it, which I think is, is an interesting one given the situation that we find ourselves in today in Afghanistan. And with that, I thank you very much. And I would like to open this up to any questions that you might have. Um, thank you. There are jobs that women can do in Afghanistan. Um, there are places that make it very difficult for women to do their jobs there. Um, we've had a significant number of women actually on our staff. We have a number of women on our staff now. There are, there are parts of Afghanistan where it is difficult to be a woman in the field, um, especially if you're an Afghan. Yep. Um, it's, it's actually not much of a problem if you're an American. Uh, yep or a Westerner in general. Um, but if you're an Afghan, there's, there's a, a strong sense of expectation about what your role should be. And that can be difficult. We've done a lot of training of women in Afghanistan, um, veterinarians and others. The problem has been, once they're trained up, what they're actually allowed to do after that. And that becomes a problem. Very good question. Um, historically, there has been an assumption that there's somewhere between one and 200 snow leopards in the country. Um, and that was primarily based on what is known about snow leopard densities in general, which is not much, um, and on what was assumed to be snow leopard habitat, available habitat in the country. So it was not based on any kind of surveys or knowledge about snow leopards in the country. What we found is that snow leopards seem to be doing very well. We don't have an actual count right now. Um, the work we're doing with our camera trap study, uh, we're now doing basically a, a capture recapture study that should actually give us a population estimate. Probably within about a year, we should actually have that data analyzed. Um, but we know that, I mean, we've taken 5,000 plus photographs of snow leopards at this point. Um, we have captured four of them. The first one we captured, we captured within the same night that we put out the snares, um, which I'd like to think is luck. It probably is. Um, but the, the intimation from all of this data is that snow leopards seem to be doing very well in that country. I think partly it's because there's not much hunting up there. Um, there's very little targeted snow leopard hunting. It's so isolated that when snow leopards are killed by people, it's primarily by shepherds in response to loss of livestock. Um, it's not part of any kind of international trade in snow leopard skins. Uh, snow leopards are being killed at times, a lot less now, now that we've got these communities involved in, in the park development and the rangers out there working. So we feel very positive about snow leopards right now in this country. Um, you know, it's obviously dependent on many things, including security in the country in general. But one of the advantages for snow leopards, I was saying this earlier, um, was that they, they live in a place that, that not many people like to go, in the very, very high mountains. And in Afghanistan especially, where they're, they're found, the Wakhan Corridor, Wakhan National Park now, is, contains about 70% of snow leopard habitat in the country. So probably about 70% of the population of snow leopards. And outside of local people, nobody goes there. It's too far. It's too difficult. Um, it's just not worth it. And because of that, I think snow leopards have a real chance of, of not just surviving, but doing well in the country, no matter what. There, I, I don't have the data in my head at the moment. They seem to be sort of average, um, for want of a better term. I mean, snow leopard ranges can vary enormously. 
That was what we've we've found. Um, in some places, they seem to be very localized. We've had animals. I mean, in Mongolia, uh, especially where where they will travel just enormous distances. Um, our animals seem to be doing regular circuits, which I find very interesting, um, where they're going up in these valleys and, and coming back around and going up again, coming back around, and just doing these circuits over a period of a few weeks, um, over and over and over again. And every once in a while, they'll take off in a little junket, the one that went to Tajikistan as an example. Um, but uh, I think it was a she came back um, and is sort of back in, in the area that she had been using before. So they, they seem to have very secure, the ones that we have collared anyway, seem to have very secure home ranges that are not all that big, at least in terms of the snow leopard. Um, I think you know, part of it is that there's, there's also a lot of prey up there. Big cats, they're, they're, their numbers are defined by prey density. And there's a lot of ibex, which is their favorite prey. There's a decent amount of Marco Polo sheep still, which is a secondary prey. Um, marmots, which are very, very important in summer, are not heavily hunted by Afghans. Um, they don't kill them for food. They're, they're killed by guard togs a lot, but otherwise it's, they're doing comparatively well as, as compared to other areas where they actually are hunted for food or fur. So there's, there's a lot for snow leopards to eat, and I think that's one of the reasons why they're keeping to fairly small home ranges and why there are probably a decent number of, of the cats there. For the most part, no, interestingly enough. I mean, if you look at where they're found, um, we have Persian, we've actually caught Persian leopards and camera traps in Bamiyan district, the central portion of the country. Um, but they're not found up in the high mountains. So they're, they're basically ecologically separated. Some of the smaller cats may come into, into competition, but again, they seem to separate out pretty nicely by, by habitat type. The, the jungle cat is usually found in, in tall grass or bushy areas, especially along rivers. Um, the leopard cat is in the forests in the east primarily. Lynx is found at high elevations as well. So in some ways, they're probably competing a little bit with snow leopards for medium-sized prey. They certainly will take smaller sheep and goats, um, as well as hares and other animals. So they seem to segregate out pretty nicely in the country, and only in some places are they liable to be competing. Um, very close. Um, actually, we're partnering, even as we speak, um, finishing the paperwork to help the, the snow leopard, well, actually it's panthera in this case. Um, I keep forgetting, Tom McCarthy is some of you who may know. Um, he was with Snow Leopard Trust and moved to panthera, but we're going to be helping them with the capturing of snow leopards on the Tajik side of the border, where they have a small project. We'll be capturing and collaring snow leopards. So we're helping them with the actual capture part of that. Um, and we've done that with the Snow Leopard Trust as well. Um, I'm good friends with, with the people who work for them. So we're very, very close with them, which is nice. And my wife's from Seattle as well, so, <laughs> so I, I get to visit them a lot. Well, I'd, I'd actually been doing a lot of bird work, and I like birds a lot, but I think of myself as a, as a mammal person to some degree. So I wanted my next project to be on a mammal, and I wanted it to be on a mammal that nobody knew much about and that was in need of conservation efforts on its behalf, and that wasn't like a mouse, <laughs> but that, that wasn't something that everybody studied. You know, I didn't want to go work on tigers or white-tailed deer or something like that. And, I'm a field guide junkie by nature, so I, I, it sort of ended up narrowing down to between what's called the Congo water civet, um, which is found in Western Africa, and the woolly flying squirrel. It sort of fit my bill for a mammal of you know, decent size, but nobody knew anything about either one of them. And I'm, I'm not a big fan of the tropics, because I sweat a lot. So <laughs> it was the squirrel. <laughs> and, and what I didn't realize at the time when I made that decision, I knew nothing was really known about the animal, but I didn't realize that experts thought it was extinct. And I went over there not recognizing that most people thought that. And when I was there, I realized that nobody knew anything. Um, you know, th the area is so dramatically vertical in northern Pakistan that, you know, where I was walking, there could be a party of 50 woolly flying squirrels 20 feet above my head having a big party, and I'd never know it. 
So it, it just became very obvious that there was a need to really do a good search for them. And, and I kept getting hints that the animals were out there, stories that people would tell me, mostly lies, um, <laughs> very clearly, you know, that they hung from their feet in caves, that they, they, they sucked the milk from goats at night, um, <laughs> that, that if you ate their meat um, with your left hand behind your back without saying bismillah, the, the bowl would never run out. Um, just a variety of things. And, and I'll just tell you a quick anecdote. How I actually found the animal relates to this sort of thing, because I, I was going into a valley that was especially um, it was considered a little dangerous just because it was sort of really off the beaten track and locals were a little feisty. And so I checked in at a police station at the base of the valley before I went up just to let them know I was doing this. And they asked me why I was going and I said I was looking for the woolly flying squirrel Cherge in the Shina language. And they all started laughing and I said, why are you laughing? And they said, oh, it's, it's excrement is used as an aphrodisiac and it's collected by people up there. And I was like, right, okay, great. And I, I went up in the valley, and I was, I was trapping with these big live traps, and I was catching little baby red foxes and stone martens and all these things, and no woolly flying squirrels. And one day, a very large and frightening looking man with a great big beard and a Kalashnikov rifle came out of the bush and said, I hear you are looking for Cherge. And I said, yes. He said, if I find one, will you give me $40? Well, you know, you've got the gun, so yes. Um, <laughs> and, and he said, give me that bag. So I gave him the bag because he had a gun. And he disappeared. And six hours later, he came back with the live woolly flying squirrel in the bag. And it turns out that this guy was a solid collector. Solid is an indurated matrix of woolly flying squirrel urine and feces. And these guys climb up in these caves and collect it because these squirrels poop a lot, apparently. Um, and they mix it with almond, and they make it into a paste, and they sell it as an aphrodisiac. And, and you can buy it all over Pakistan, oddly enough. Uh, <laughs> what can I say? But it turned out that that was the trick. I just had to find the solid collectors. I didn't have to find the squirrels. And they would find the squirrels for me. So. Not much. I mean, snow leopards are, are, are very much revered in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, there are various stories. I, I'm not sure I know any that I can spin off the top of my head that I've heard about the animals. Um, stories where they have magic powers, that sort of thing. Um, and, and villagers have a great deal of respect for the cats. I mean, they, as, as, a, as a big cat, snow leopards aren't quite as as dangerous as tigers, so there's, there's less of that kind of awe and fear, which is, I think is helpful for the snow leopard's sake. Um, I mean, there's stories of people who have gone into corrals where snow leopards have, have fallen in after trying to go after livestock, and they've actually beaten snow leopards to death with a stick. So, so they're not, they're not I mean, they're big, scary animals. I would not get in a pen with one myself, but that the fact that they're not quite as dangerous as many of the other big cats, I think, has really helped their cause and local people don't have that fear that drives them to try to kill them. I think it's important. There are. Um, there are a lot. In, in Pakistan, where I was working, they speak, I mean, besides Urdu, it's, it's Brishaski and Waki and Balti and Shina. Um, I mean, I took six and a half years of French, and all I know is je m'appelle Pierre. I'm just, I'm bad with language. So, and I, and I think that was actually helpful for this work because I used translators. And, and that saved me from making faux pas. And, and you don't want to make faux pas in many of these areas. It's just, it's, you, you want to say the right thing in the right way. That's very important. And I think my translators, since I'm still standing here, we're very good <laughs> at, at taking what I was saying and making it culturally appropriate. Yeah, there's actually an inter if I can just bore you for a moment with another anecdote. In 2006, I was asked to go to Pakistan to bring a snow leopard back to the Bronx Zoo. Um, a small cub had been found by local people, and ha they had raised it to the point where it was big and causing some trouble. And they didn't have uh, a zoo that was capable of handling snow leopards. The zoos in Pakistan are all in the south where it's very hot. And so they based, the Pakistan government contacted the State Department, the US State Department, and said, do you have a place that could handle a snow leopard? They contacted the Bronx Zoo. And of course, they called me up and said, 
go get the snow leopard. So I went over there with, with some of our zoo folks, brought it back. It got a lot of press because I think it was an interesting example of, again, how wildlife conservation can, can bring countries together. As you know, the US and Pakistan, they're not the greatest of friends either. But here was an opportunity where, where the snow leopard, whose name is Leo, um, just because of, as a cub, apparently they go, Leo, Leo. So they named it that. Uh, you know, it was an, it's, it's serving as an ambassador for Pakistan now in the Bronx. Zoo. You know, it gets seen by millions of, of visitors every year. And we have a plaque about the whole story. It got a lot of press at the time. Leo actually just had a, a cub last year, his first. He was, he was dating for a number of years. <laughs> so, but I think it's, it's certainly the first wild caught snow leopard to enter at least the U.S zoo system in some time. So it's very exciting from a, a sort of genetics perspective. Well, thank you.